and entirely unformed us, together with our perception of their form, function, and fundamental materiality. In the alchemy of material. Three years ago, Keith called Square the Block, he shifted our perception of the solidities of stones. It appeared that some giant hand had entirely compressed and twisted up a huge section at the side of my story London building. This sculpture of hot dog gold, he crumpled a metal burger bag, such a vessel and in time pieces of material, a scrunched up, delicately white and crispy piece of paper. I first saw Richard's work in 1991, where he also transformed to Elvis. It was his most popular work, 26, first created in, in 1987, but then brought and displayed a John Archie Fame Band in the Gallery It was displayed in its own room, and I saw it entirely alone walking down its thin metal walkway, which becomes increasingly narrow as it leads the visitor to the center of the room. The first thing that strikes you is the pungent, heavy smell. You're surrounded by a lake of sun oil that floods the space and follows every minute contour of the walls of the room. The oil seems blacker than the blackest night. But paradoxically, it creates a vivid, dazzling bright reflection which exactly mirrors the architecture of the entire room. You are seemingly immersed waist deep in a 360 degree perfectly symmetrical visual plane. <coughs> Deeply beautiful, but frighteningly separate, like entering another realm, another world. As you look up above you, there is the ceiling and sky through the window. But look down and the ceiling and sky are still there below you in a perfect, vanishing, effective, double image falling away from you. You feel suspended in space and time. As Richard himself has put it, if it goes right, you feel as if you were falling out into the sky. <coughs> in one way, the installation is definitely simple, but as one critic put it, it is a sign of epic illusion. In the next month and years, I went to see it dozens of times and literally dragged friends along. You have to go and see this. Exhibitions changed regularly in the early 1990s, and these were the glory years of the young British artists, several years before the seminal sensation exhibition in 1997. But 2050 was so good that it became and still remains the only piece that Saatchi had on permanent display since 1991. There were some brilliant Saatchi exhibitions when I first saw the work in the early 90s. I remember Jenny Savile's monumental female nude, a gloriously kitsch Jeff Coon show, and Mark Quinn's self-portrait head, a refrigerated life-size bust, sculpted entirely out of his own frozen blood. Some sensational works, for sure, but for me, none as sensational as 2050, which was always the piece I returned to. The piece appeared in all three manifestations of Sarch's galleries, as well to Japan, America, and Australia. It has come to epitomize installation art. The third major reference book on the field entitled Installation Art was published in 1996. Naturally enough, 2050 was depicted on the cover. Richard's works over the years have been astonishing in both their power and variety. From a suspended fiberglass glass hull of a swivel dissected by a 60 foot pipe to a central representation of his London house transferred to a rural site in Japan. In his, his, his acclaimed turning the plaza, Rich cut a large eight meter diameter disc out of the facade of a delicate building and mounted it on a motorized spindle. This cut out, sawn off slab of the building then revolves three dimensionally, turning inside out in what is quite an extraordinary sight. An allied split screen film gives a vivid and vertiginous perspective on the piece, and is one of Richard's inputs into the Royal Academy Encounter exhibition currently showing in our galleries outside. As Rosie Lesso has written, quote, it is a dangerous and dramatic work, all the more powerful given the rundown quality of the building. Danger and drama are quintessential elements of Richard's work, as are daring, surprise, and glorious ambition. Richard once him, described himself, and I quote, as a version of Brunel, a short git wanting to do enormous things. Tonight, he'll be sharing with us his plans for one of his most enormous works, a commission for a new terminal building at London's Heathrow Airport. It will be a monumental work by a monumental artist. 
His international reputation includes major BNIs in Venice, Sydney, and Sao Paulo, a large number of international public works and museum shows, and two Turner Prize nominations. Richard Wilkes is a true original with a singular approach to art. Like many great artists, his work operates at many levels. His effects are both visceral and cerebral. He combines breathtaking images with wit and humor, and high precision engineering with conceptual brilliance. He creates unique, beautiful sculptures, provocative spatial dislocations, and thought provoking spectacles. He is, of course, much lauded by critics and academics. T.J. Dennis has noted his astounding creativity and visual delight his intense engagement with the relation between matter and perception. Tony Godfrey, who is here tonight, has discussed the ability to make the familiar strange and to create disquieting spaces we can no longer relax in or take for granted. Andrew Graham Dixon has called his 2050 one of the masterpieces of the modern age. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please give a huge welcome to Richard Wilkins. <laughs> And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here this evening. And of course, thank you to the Sal College of Art uh, for making it possible for me to be here. And also to Fortune Cookie Project, who have enabled such wonderful things to take place best place, and also for me to be here. I've been back 25 years, as we said quite a bit, that's a, a good sort of project history for you to understand. I'll show about 15 works. They're not necessarily in chronological order, but what they are is they're demonstrating strings to my bow. Um, and of course, you know, the most famous one, or the most well known one, I should say, 2050. First, 25 years ago, 1987, Mass Gallery, uh, a small independent public space that was willing to put, you know, chance and cash behind an idea that was just a letter to him, um, which ended up as Steve has pointed out, far to go. 2050 is a completely psychological experience. And describing that means that I've seen people go into this piece of work and suffer vertigo, grab the sides of the tank and have to be hauled back out. And what that was doing was doing something extraordinary uh, to the perfect human. It meant there was a slight hiccup between what your eye is doing and what the brain is doing. And the best way I've ever found of describing that is if you ever sat at a traffic light, the lights are red, the car next to you edges forward, you don't run backwards and you go for the handbrake. Or you're at a station waiting to leave on the train, the train next to you goes out and you think you're up at head off, but you realise the platform beyond that carriage next to you is actually at it, and therefore there's that hiccup. That's 2050 does. And all the works I'll, try, I'll show you this evening are trying to do a kind of fundamental job, which is to sort of challenge the preconceptions we have of our world. And the best way for me to be able to do that is not with a vocabulary of shape or form, but to take the given shape and form of the existing world, ships, boats, planes, whatever it happens to be, architecture predominantly, and tweak it in such a way that it will surprise us and challenge what we thought we knew if we got to look again. So the first obvious one here is, you know, X hundred gallons of waste oil, hazardous waste material. But in actual fact, what is extraordinary is almost everybody I've ever heard describe this thing, talk about notions of beauty. So already one second of material has gone through its own transformation over millions of years from fossilized material to death like oil. And what happens if you talk about that in a completely different way? You talk about that hazardous material as being something extraordinary, doing something extraordinary. It's difficult to say where all ideas come from in terms of the work that I do. But they come from, they fire from many, many different points. And the very first thing that I start to try and think about is how to make the sense of an interior much greater than an exterior. And I suppose the easiest way of describing that is anyone has ever heard of Doctor Who. And the police box, the TARDIS. When you enter that small police box, telephone box, the interior is much greater than its exterior as we understand it. And that's really the seed that was trying to sort of become a work. How, how can I make interior much bigger than we assume to be? 
and so the reflection works in a way. There's a walkway here that places the viewer to the object. Everything else is the surrounding world. But somehow you become the object within an environment. And to get into that position, you walk and struggle, recognising that you're walking slightly uphill. That's the complete opposite of walking, oh, I say walking, wading out off the beach, you know, where it, there's a distance of descent. Um, it's interesting, my um, sort of uh, repertoire of work, repertoire of works, has always been described as being site-specific, particularly this one. It's actually not. It's not site-dependable. It's actually something that has been around the world nine times, and, or in nine locations around the world, um, and fits the topology of any room that I choose to place it in. It's a tank that's just filled with oil that reflects the space around it. All you're doing is you're looking at the architecture within that room, albeit upside down. So what I'll do is I'll just use a couple of those lo nine locations to give you some idea of the way in which it doesn't have to be site dependable. What actually happens is the ingredients remain the same. It's the focus that changes. So we've gone from... Um, sorry, I'm going to try it. We've gone from that first one you saw. It's actually the first installation. It's made the same year as the first one. I made it a Max Gallery, as I pointed out earlier. I went immediately from Max Gallery to the Royal Scottish Academy. And then from the Royal Scottish Academy, it, it travelled, it called upon. So it ended up going to Mito Art Hour. The previous picture I showed you was the last incarnation, which was Boundary Road. And this is the largest of the that it's ever um, been built at. And it's quite an engineering feat to actually make the make the um, the levels throughout the whole room so we don't spill. But as you can see, what you have is the reflection of the of the roof down into the oil below. And the sense of vertigo therefore is in half. It feels as if you're going to be dropping out into the sky. But I've always been fascinated by the fact that there's a kind of Ferris effect that by looking down into the oil, you can see the reality above you, but in the real sense, you can't. There's a kind of refractive moment that gives you a view on something that you wouldn't normally see in your life. It might be the answer to finding a blanket. Um, so this me to Art Tower. This was the... Um, gosh, where was that? That's Australia. I think that was Melbourne, actually. Canberra. Canberra Museum. And more recently, the, again, Sochi at the county hall. Very interesting situation here. This was the smallest, the smallest, and people do compare them. And in this one, you'll notice the clock wall. When we were building tanks, these clocks were being fitted back into their original location. And I said to the builder, could you please set that hand to 29 or 29? Um, and he said, they don't work, mate. They don't work. They're broken. Don't worry about that, just set it at 10 to 9. We had this kind of little bit of an argument. But it's that fine tuning you have to do with every idea that you come up with as an artist. I mean, 20, 50, 10 to 9, if you take a 24 hour clock. So, a way, it's that fine tuning for an idea. In the same way, the door was opened into that other room. So, when you got to the very end of that corridor, having struggled up that slight slope, you really wanted to lean out to see how that oil went into the next room and, and that sense of it expanding and flooding and taking over all the space. Um, the latest incarnation, I have to admit, there has been an argument with the owner about allowing members of the public into that corridor. At the moment, this is down in a basement space and there is a kind of a viewing platform that allows you to experience the work and experience that reflection, that perfect parallel of what was real world and what is rubbish world, a reflected world. But um, he decided that he could only enter that space if he phoned and asked permission. And the reason is a, a, a free museum. There's no charge for going to see the collection. But because of that, I was told that he has five coach loads of kids, so it's very difficult to manage that number of people going into the space. There's been a compromise with the work. I said that you could get on to life if you allow them to the end of the corridor. Um, so we had kind of impasse at that point. I'm, I'm sort of um, still nervous about where it's being treated because it's a logical conclusion. You know, you could end up once you've you know, disappeared off. Things get changed and changed. That idea is with the, the. What's interesting, I've just thrown in here, you know, the way in which ideas get going. When I 
I was away on holiday around about 1986, the year before I was 30. And I went away thinking about what I could do, at, as I said, at Gallery 87. And it was in a eureka moment on a Sunday afternoon in Portugal, down in the Algarve, that I knew I needed to convert the room into a tank that's flooded. But I had no material, so I cycled into the local village, and it was going through a dusty, and I found a shoebox. And that was the very first model. And subsequently, the only thing I've ever kept out of everything that was produced for the project, because it was the nucleus of an idea. It was found to be a ground in. It seemed to represent the way in which a lot of work is made, is that, you know, taking what's given, and you can transcend and transform it beyond what you think there to be. This is a piece of rubbish in a dustbin. It's a price of the in my in my head. So that's really, you know, the beginning of 2050, and it tells you something about site specificity or not. The next piece of work is, is built in the very same space as where 2050 was built, but it was realised two years later. And it's work with Matt's gallery, obviously one is invited to make a solo exhibition, a piece of work that somehow responds to site. And this is an example where I'd say it possibly was site-specific, but I was caught out that we did actually sell the notion of the idea, which surprised me. Um, I say that specific, what I mean by that is works that in some way are informed by their setting, and particularly with the way I work, they actually are, the, the setting is enlisted in some way. And in this particular situation, I was fighting and struggling against the history of 2050 in its sense. How could I go beyond that really good or, you know, sort of successful idea? Um, and I started to look at the window, the art, in terms of the architecture, the sense of boundary to the space. In some way, the oil somehow transformed the space and made it much bigger. I started to think about complete reverse in a very physical way, rather than dealing with illusion. And I started looking at the window as something at the boundary, the periphery of architecture, that we tend, tend to take for granted. We don't stare at windows, we look at our world beyond the window. So, as an archaeologist, I inspected structure and, without too much damage, decided to undo the window space and somehow draw it into the room so that the interior space of Max Gallic shrunk and yet the space of the world outside flooded in and met the barrier, the new barrier that I created um, within the Max Gallery space. And the technique doing that was quite simple. What I decided to do was undo the window, mount on a set of boulders, and move it around the room until I found a position where I felt that the onlooker would feel somewhat compressed with the interior. It was very difficult to get back and see the complete work. You were always close to it. Um, and once I'd seized that position, then thinking about, you know, the sort of... Um, language of the window, the curtain, the puckering of material, that sort of thing, the brittleness and the fragility between inside and outside. I then echoed that in the way it would be built. So in this instance, the sides of this structure, which are pulled back and run beyond the boundary of the building, uh, are made in a plastic, a very heavy duty plastic puckered material. And the top and the bottom echo something of the gallery space, which is this sense of the full ceiling, where rather like raising a window, you set up a section of bars, and you drop panels into them, in this case with softboard. What it indicates in terms of the works you'll see and what you saw before is that I'm working with this idea of transformation, I'm coming to all things with ideas, and the material I use to find has to suit the idea, so it's not like I work with stone or wood or steel or whatever. You know, I have an idea about something, about transformation and a change, and basically working and playing with an architectural voice initially. And then one finds them the best material to work with. So, hence, the set of that fragility between the perimeter of outside and inside. And as I said, that boundary was extended beyond, or the boxing to boundary was ex extended beyond. So there's a sort of set of refraction going on, rather like putting a pencil or a ruler into an aquarium. You know, the thing has a kind of funny bit to it. So it's very difficult to decide exactly where that boxing related to the, architect the staticness of the architecture. That is called, uh, she came in through the bathroom window. Uh, not the Beatles version, I much prefer the Joe Cocker version. 
this was my last, I've got these three together because they're all to do with working with uh, this quite extraordinary guy, Jim Classic, and I worked with him up until 1996 with Max Gallery. And this was a new space that he founded um, in the East End. It's always been, always been located in the East End. And this is where he started to expand into con two spaces rather than one. The idea that enough would be in showing and one art to be in building and setting up. So, you know, the, the artist used the gallery studio and then produced the work that became the site for, you know, a lot of And what, uh, I was invited to make the first show in this space. I thought the best thing to do was actually try and do something outside the rented area. I wanted people to come in and look at the space that he had and to find the work sitting at the periphery rather like this notion of what the window was doing. And the initial idea wasn't this one. What you're looking at here is a full-size billiard table. And billiard tables were built in this street, I discovered. Um, but the initial idea was for something completely different that was going to be located, as I say, outside the rented space within the floor structure. And the great thing, of course, is that Robin doesn't always consider the architecture the most important thing. The work is the most important thing, and you can tamper with the structure that you put back with reason. And in this situation, I decided to place something, and in testing and excavating, I hit something which is called uh, London's water table, and that means that London basically sits in a basin of clay, and the water runs off down to etc., and it collects in that basin and is siphoned off into the River Thames. But, you know, a couple of hundred years ago, we had industry that would drop down pipes and suck that water and convert it to steam and rapids, and there was never really an issue. More recently in London, we had a rising damp problem, and it's because no one's pulling that water off and can't quite escape because of the amount of build that's been taking place. So what I've done is I've dug down to put something in the hole. Discovered I hit something further down, which was actually, in instance, liquid sand. And if I went any further, I was jeopardised in the structure of the building because these columns would slide in. Now what you can do is three things in that situation. You can throw a lot of money at it to make it work. Um, or you change the idea. I was going to say, or you can sort of work around the bureaucracy that tells you that you can't do that. Um, but in this instance, I decided, rather than, than the water table being a problem, that that actually had to be the thing I had to work with, because it, it was never going to go away. So what I decided to do was to place something in there, but to announce the problem I found in some kind of imaginative way. And by that, the bit tape acquires a seventh hole. You've got a six pocket, but you've got this seventh hole, which takes the form of a 28-inch wide Hepworth sewer pipe that goes down four metres into the ground and down to the water table of London. And in that pipe, I built a kind of paddle mechanism that worked randomly throughout the day, so that every now and again we walked into the quiet of that room and discovered something at that perfect level of floor. The sense of order at that table announces against the kind of chaoticness of what you were hearing. And you walk right up to the very edge of the table and peer down into that sort of murky world of the pipe with this mystery that was taking place down there with these paddles every now and again just... <clears throat> rather like the way the balls kiss when you play a soft shot on the game. So you're drawn into this other world. But at the same time, what was lovely is that if you went to the windows of the gallery and you looked outside, there were references that said there was the canal outside. And across from the canal was these vast gas holders. And as you understand, in the UK, we store gas in these great big sort of membrane of steel. And they work on an interesting pressure. So when they're full, they rise. And as the gas is used and drawn off, they sit down. So the sense of this architecture working at ground level, below ground level, above ground level, the references were out of the window. They were feeding the information. There's a wonderful collision between the sense of perfection that the table and the sense of order and discipline of the game require against the rough cut of the hole in which the piece sat in. So there were all these lovely kind of clashes that were taking place. Um, I'm just going to rush a bit now because there's some situations here I just want to demonstrate where you know, certain pieces are very specific. This is a piece made at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Oslo. 
It was an, ex an exhibition organised by the British Council back in the 80s um, about sites to see. And as you can see here, what I've done is I've taken the English version, the Scandinavian chalet, and I've taken it to Oslo. But the Scandinavian chalet has lost a great deal of its interior. It's been acquired a much greater interior, and that is a copy of the wall and the floor of the gallery itself. So there's a little play in London, more object-based, I suppose, about the way in which interior and exterior have that collision. And of course, it works perfectly in this room. In fact, people would walk in one door, round the piece, compress behind and out, but also across the floor. It kind of ran down into the actual floor of the gallery. But it's a big work, it doesn't quite make any sense at all. Um, going to another piece of work, this is a disused space of Dilston Hall, or Dilston Grove, which was a Methodist church hall. It's actually the first example of cast concrete. And it's, it was running a programme um, of three artists whilst the main gallery space in the Southwark Park was being converted. It had acquired lottery money, the gallery was being converted, they acquired this one in which to locate ideas so they didn't sort of lose profile to the community. But what was intriguing me about this space in South Park, along with the open air swimming pool in the park, was that these were community spaces that were lost in chronic dereliction. And it was a bit of a turnaround for me in terms of where like, most of my ideas, I feel, come from a formalist position. I mean, I was a, um, a student from 71 to 74, and then a postgraduate from 74 to 76. So all my influences, I felt, were coming very much from a pre-American ideal. And that was seen to me quite formalist. Um, but with this one, I suddenly jumped out of that. And it was to do with context. It was to do with why does an empty building come derelict? And I took the metaphor of energy as being why it happened. It's to do with the fact that when there's good energy in a building, not the same shoe of a building, but good energy, people putting their energy into a building and making use of a building, architecture survives. It's when that energy is withdrawn or is dissipated that things fall in dereliction. So I take that metaphor with the, the derelict swimming pool and the derelict building. I uh, worked with a, uh, a very dear friend of mine, Paul Burwell, who was a Paul Burwell, who was a percussionist. And I got to play all day in swimming pool on a trolley and we film of him where the camera followed him everywhere. So, in fact, when you played the film back, the background was moving. He was static and central all the time to Frank. Uh, and then that film was edited up and taken in Dilston Grove and positioned on a huge acoustic wall that was constructed, located at one end of the space. And a diesel generator was brought in and fuel up and battery power to start it and obviously screened up the handrail. And that diesel generator fired up and powered the film of the drummer playing to the sound of the diesel generator. So the cycle of activity going on, the energy physicality of a machine running through to human endurance playing. I mean, we all day, we edited it to 40 minutes, we collapse at the end of the day, they come back up and play. So we had the situation perpetuating itself. And of course, the, you know, the point being here is that there could be a, a point in the program where the engine gets turned off, and then everything goes back to derelict once more. As Steve's pointed out, I mean, this on, you know, first week is a steel framework. Actually, it's a steel framework of a house I used to own in South East London in a place called Rotherhide. So it's very difficult to discern that. What it is, it's a linear drawing uh, that's been converted into steel. It's sitting in the village of Nakasato in Niigata Prefecture on the west coast of Japan. Now the story here is that um, a friend of mine, Fran Kitagawa-san, who runs up in Tokyo, in Tokyo, was invited as a director to come up conjure up an idea for the prefectory of Niigata. What was happening in Niigata prefecture was that the young were leaving the rural places, the villages, um, and going to the cities and leaving the old folk there. So in fact, what had 
what the government discovered was that the Negatar tree factory was dying. Uh, they had very severe winters, you know, sort of four, four months of snow, deep snow. And you'd have your eight, you know, planting. And what Fram Kidgower came up with, a, a 10 year program, which is actually flowing to that now, but a 10 year program where he would invite from around the world artists to come and somehow integrate with the community. To do that would be to get involved with school education. It would be also to get involved in the craft techniques that the industry is, you know, once upon a time used and welcomed and, and produced. And also to invite a number of artists um, every year to locate works with only one statement or one discipline. And that it, it had to be a relationship. You could do whatever you want, but the key word for everybody is you have to have a relationship in some way to the site, to the region, to the prefecture. And I was in Los Angeles at the time, and I flew to Japan, and as someone who works with, art, with predominantly architecture, in serious, I went to this rural region, this mountainous region, and I thought, I can't do anything here, it's not going to work. And I got back on an aeroplane and flew back to London. But it's in that flight, as I woke one early morning and noticed that extraordinary curve of the, Earth, the Earth's surface, and I suddenly started to think about the sense of relationship between having come from Japan and going back to London. And what I started to look at is my house in London. What happened if I transposed it around the world to Nikita Prefectory, to this, uh, this site here, uh, Nakasato Village? But I set it at the exact angle that stood in Rotherhide. And the way you do that is through having very good friends, in this instance, Price and Mars structural engineers who I work a lot with. And they calculated for me the angles of what they call collimation off the North Star. So they could tell me that my house in London is exactly at that position to the North Star. And if you take around the world, you normally build, if, you, if that's Japan around there, you build like that. In this instance, you take around the world like this. The background here comes upside down because it's almost like you just push it straight away through. It would be exactly the two. So there are two houses on the planet. They're both, one after the other, but they're both set at the exact angle. So what you're looking at here is the base level, or the ground level, is the top bit. Then it backs the front face, and then you've got the mansard roof stuck in the ground, and it's all grown over slightly. And what's so beautiful about this position, it stands right next to the temple gateway to the temple that was up the road, which dictates the vertical horizontal of Japan. So you've got the one sense of vertical and horizontal of the London. When they're transposed round, they're absolutely random. And I've always said I'd like to make that temple in Rotherhide. But yeah, in Japan. Um, what's great is, you know, the phone always rings. And, you know, sometimes the gigs take a couple of years. Sometimes the gigs are really fast, and you get a phone call, can you do something really quickly? And this is a situation where I was invited up to uh, a place called the Story Gallery in Lancaster. And they were closing down. They'd been awarded some money, lottery money, to convert part of the gallery space, this being the gallery space. They'd been given some money to make an entrance. And the thing that one has to understand in all these that you're seeing is not that I'm a vandal and I attack architecture. The hidden agenda is I find out what's happening or I'm told what's happening. I know just how much I can tweak. So to the audience, it's normally a jaw-dropping situation, like how can you get permission? But the permission are normally given. I don't go in vandalise. I go in there and sensitively choreograph. In this instance, although probably heavily overheated, what happened here is this kind of upright straight arrow shape is the, going to be the new entry. So that doorway, that whole wall is being demolished. So I had permission, given the last show before the builders moved in, to do what I had to do. So I cut the doorway away and mounted it onto a gantry system. And it became a kind of an arrow that points to a future. And the idea was it wound itself back up the slope of the gantry, then free fall down and hit into the objective space, the open doorway space, and cluttered and banged, and then drew itself back up again. It was 
talking about the past being taken apart and pointing to a new future. So that gives you a bit more of a, an understanding about what's going on. And it's really where, you know, the sort of sanctity and, you know, the fact that architecture um, is seen as something that you're not allowed to tamper with. Um, what is wonderful is that, you know, the thing does ring in these situations where I am allowed to play. Okay, so we're now at 2000. This is the Arco Trent. And it was a sand dredger that worked off the French-German coastline, collecting sand, bringing it back to the south coast of England. And I show this photograph because this relates to an exhibition that took place to mark the millennium 2000 in London. The 25 artists around Great Britain were invited to submit ideas. And none of us finally chose ideas, and they were to be located around the peninsula of the, what they call Blackwall Point. It's actually on the south, uh, on the south side of London, downstream from Tower Bridge. And again, working with architecture, I put in a proposal that was to take a slice out of a ship and place it on what we call the GMT line, the zero time line for shipping. And if you can slice a district the timeline, you can put a slice on it to announce that. But there are other reasons as well. I mean, we have in that part of the world at Greenwich, uh, an extraordinary blaze of history to Navy, but nothing to the merchant seamen. So this was to kind of readdress that. It was also just off from the Millennium Dome, and when one thinks about that sort of canopy or parcel of skin, playing around with a sense of parcel by chopping something that was a steep skin. It opened up, you know, the possibility of seeing inside. So I was trying to talk about those parcels and paralleling it to the Millennium Dome itself. Um, but really, the, the fundamental here, which was a bit of a hiccup for me, was I actually thought I wanted something that was more of a lament. And by that, again, coming back to context, I mean, in 1936, the coronation of King George, seats were placed all the way around this peninsula, so people in London could sit and watch shipping coming in and going out to our Commonwealth, bringing in goods or taking out goods, bringing in well, taking out well. Um, you won't see that today on this river, the River Thames. Um, it's pretty, pretty much unused by most shipping. There's a, a you know, craft trade, but that's just about it. So in a way, I wanted something that might weep its way back into the river. And in that respect, I mean something that would sit there and start to rust and fall in. And of course, these, ring, these do ring alarm bells with um, curatorial teams and certainly owners at the site, because that kind of almost suggests rubbish. So one's got to be careful about announcing those kind of things. But in actual fact, I mean, I've got a couple of pictures subsequent took place, because the piece ran for one year, all the work there during the celebrations of one year. And although that was the intention, along with the more formal ones and so forth, it was able, at the end of the exhibition, to, to keep it where it is. I've actually paid for a license in the piece now made as public work, albeit, I have to admit, in need of some remedial repair, because these things do take the weather quite badly, being steel and they rust. So, but the piece is still there, it's been there for 11 years. It's a, you know, it's a public work, it's got you in the out, out in the open. And up to a couple of years ago, we used to have what's called London Open House. People would, well, it's been going on, but I used to invite people to London Open House on board so they could come and read something of the history of the situation, put up drawings and plans, charts about the making of this piece of work. And subsequent to that, you know, it, does, it is actually used now. This is kind of like the top floor, the fourth, you know, what's called the bridge. But it's like a drawing. I go there and use this as a drawing studio. It's also a place where I go and meet clients. I mean, it's a, it's in the, you know, if you're something like this and you're trying to get a gig on somebody, it's very difficult for them to say no because they can understand that you're actually capable of doing this kind of scale of work. So the piece is used in that way. This used to be an office um, and it has subsequent, you know, other floors. It's all used. It's not, it's 
not used much now. Like I say, I go there to do the drawing and meeting with clients. But um, and how long it's going to be there, I don't know. But what this next piece is trying to describe, this is now 2003. Um, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to word it. What happens as an artist is you get to a point in your career where you know your party piece. And by that means you know when you can succeed. You can fall back on the those moments you know work properly as well, and you keep doing that. And I knew what I could do, and I was feeling that things were comfortable, and I wanted to try and get back to a situation where, almost like being a student, where you kind of like, it's completely open, it's completely experimental, and you want to try and do something that you know nothing about. Now, how you do that, I don't know. Up until this moment, when... <laughs> I thought, what is the most basic creative act that I can try and conjure where people wouldn't even get one of my works? And I didn't even know how it's going to end. I didn't even know what the conclusion should be. And it happened by chance, washing a pair of jeans, you put your hands in, and I pulled out a fiver that was all crunched up. And I thought, shit, you know, fine. And I started to do this. And it was at that point when I started to try and unfurl it. It's something we've all done. It's something you've had no training for, but it's something that you're incredibly sensitive about. You should know the worth of the financial piece of paper. And you're actually doing a very creative thing of trying to unfold and not tear. And you can do it very carefully. You can soak it again and dry it. You know. So it was that key moment of finding something, of doing it, that prompted the condition of a, a piece of work, which was to take an object that we probably could kind of involve, completely crush it, put it into gallery, and make the process of unfurling it the piece of work without me not really knowing how it was going to be again. So what took place there was that I went and bought just the bodywork, just the skin, the aluminium skin of a Cessna light aircraft, and I had it crushed over a period of one day in a car park. <coughs> and then that crushed mass of metal was taken to the King Hydraulic Pump Station, which is now a gallery and restaurant, where the show took place in 2003. And it's suspended through a period of days while we prepared everything on the sheet and a private view. And then the next three weeks, I and a team of students from the University of East London proceeded, all untrained, we're not trained, proceeded to reclaim that congested, congealed mass of metal. There's a very interesting story I've just missed about getting the work, getting that ball of metal from that car park to whopping. Um, I did a deal at a traffic lights with a big light. I said, listen, are you free for the weekend? I'll pay you to come pick something up for me. And it's a big scaffolding lorry. And they said, yeah, sure, mate. You know. I said, sure. And they arrived, and I spent all day with five or six four, massive four trucks just compressing this thing. It was quite difficult to compress an aeroplane, but we managed to do it. And they said, where is everything moving? And I said, it's there. And they went over and started dragging it. And I said, be careful. Don't scratch it. And they looked at me as if I was completely mad. <laughs> and what, what that's got to do is, I can decide what I want to do with that material. If I choose to do it, that's me deciding that. But I didn't want their hand on it. And for that, that meant, you know, dragging it. I did. I wanted to lift it up and leave it just as me. It's this very, very peculiar moment that you'll find in all that creative thinking. You know, every now and again, you'll just bounce and hit one of those odd moments. Where it's, it's ludicrous, but you know, it occurs. And that scratching along the floor was one of them. Anyway, they inspected that and put it on the line. We brought it to Wapping Hydraulic Pump Station. And this is like a bird's eye view of when we got close to the end when we bought lots of holes in things. What we're supposed to do is take like the fiver, you start to pull it out, once you've got a bit of something out, you bore a hole into it, you put a hydraulic machine in, you pump. So it's a repetitive process of trying to reclaim, grab back the form the piece of material had, albeit it would never be a proper aeroplane, it would never fly again. And it was done both internally and externally. So all these holes were wet inside. The orange straps, a two-ton 
stress trap. So we were using the property or the gallery space as a way, in, in the same as a climber, we use the mountain. You find those moments where you can and pull that bit. And so the plane would move, and so you pull that way. So we're constantly stretching and using the box of the space or the perimeter of the space as a, a method to which we could then pull this thing out. And it meant the object was moving around. Whilst that three and a half week process took place, I decided initially to document the work by having both a static 35 mm camera, digital camera, looking down on us in our central area, and a 35 mm movie camera that would fire one frame. So we, you know, you get like, it was fired at one frame every five minutes. We're getting moments of sound with that as well. And in 2003, the technology wasn't here today, so every day, I, what we had is we had a computer around those two cameras. So every evening after everyone had finished work, I would take a form of stick and download you know, X hundred images that were taken that day, take them up onto a much bigger computer to store, and then I'd glimpse them. So every day I was watching the way in which you know, this thing was performing as it was being moved around the room. And it was over that period of three and a half weeks of constantly taking from the basement up to the top floor and downloading and looking. So I realised what we were doing is compressed mass. And we took that mass and we, we unfurled it. But in the process of unfurling it, we were taking compressed time. We were taking a day and I had it on the stick. And I was taking it upstairs and putting it in and going through and just checking out everything. But I realised it was a metamorphosis in the same way as the butterfly it goes from the caterpillar the butterfly, that's the title of this piece of work. We were going from a situation which was the screwed up mass to a butterfly moment, which had to be a film. We had to mm -hmm. go to time. We had to show something of the way time is compressed. You know, we've compressed that, now we're compressing that. So over a period of 24 hours, we closed the galleries. We worked day and night. We built a 16 foot by 9 foot screen. And then we edited over that four hours, just the daylight shots that were taken, because the cameras were working day and night. And so we edited the daylight moments, and with that, those absolute moments of sound as well, of the machinery being used. And then when the audience came back in to see where we were, what they discovered was this moment, three minute movie of the unfurling of an aeroplane, constantly doing this, in colour. And, and yet the glistening aeroplane that happened in the space from all the straps, and it was allowed to drop to the floor like a swatted gnat. But it had given its life to the movie. So you had like history, you had current. And what this did for me, this was 2003, and it generated a series of works that you see now, which were about the way in which sculpture could deal very well with mass. But I find it very difficult to, to work with the sense of process and time in sculpture, particularly time. And I realised the film did it very well. And here I was as a sculptor, working with the, you know, the actual of film, the moment of film, the real time of film, and the, the story, the history of them, as it were, the history of something that's taking place, the process. Um, and it prompted a number of works, three or four works, where I experimented with this idea of having, having an object and playing with an object, a prop almost, to deliver me the sculpture and the filmic moment. So there was a series of works, a couple of them made for a show in the, the Vatican in 85. This is a black cap, this is a big tech journey, so I literally could journey in it. I mounted it for like 50 degrees, bored a hole in the front, and then for about three days, I cut my way through to the very back with, again, hydro cutting equipment that was running in through hoses. And as I say, it took three days, I went through the engine, I went through the bulkhead of the front dashboard, I went through the suitcase, I went through the back chair and then at the back of the cab itself. And that was filmed by boring holes, rather like the aeroplane experience, the hydraulic equipment in to pump out. In this situation, this is, this is a prop that had a scaffold rig running around it where I had two camera people who just let in and watched and filmed and came back up and they went in there. And from that edit, many moments of going in and looking through a hole, in the same way as I went in, to that front bit of the front wing into a larger hole. The film was then edited up and played that back screen that you see fastened to the scaffold. 
And so it was a case of cause and effect. It was a case of process to product and a way of making action real by having it defined through historic moment filming. And one was intending to feed the other in the, you know, the cab of the story. And you could see it by watching the screen but not seeing the cab, or coming round and not seeing the film, but seeing and witnessing you know, the mass of the, the, the vehicle. So these were the kind of things that was the shot of me attempting to do engine, etc. And this led on to another piece, the gallery, same exhibition. So you'd come in at one end and you're confronted by the door, then discovered what's going on. At the other end of the gallery, where you mm -hmm. exit or enter from the other side. What I've done is I've taken you know, your classic 60s mobile home, the caravan. I bought a caravan and I put it onto a rotisserie. I this, I say I put you know, I, I work with I don't work with teams personally, I, I employ teams in. I go out, as it were, to industry and I have teams build a rotisserie for me that spun this thing. I say spun, it was more gentle than that. The caravan rotated. But the caravan had lost one end of its, you know, its off, which meant that you could see inside it. Not only could you see inside it, but I mounted a camera in there as well. And as the caravan turned, the camera turned with it. Now this is the bit you've got to get your head on, but there was a screen that was taking that live image of the interior moving. It was positioned just along from so that's what's been inside, and that's moved to the camera. So this is the screen. So when you enter the camera, you only see the screen, not like with the taxi. But what's on that screen is quite extraordinary, because as the caravan turns and the camera turns, that light scene means that there's no movement on that screen. It's not like it's turned upside down. What's happening though is the interior is animated. It's almost as if it's haunted. There's a poltergeist in there, because the cushions are rolling around. The curtains come up and go down because gravity is producing this extraordinary phenomenon of this, you know, the fridge door would open and close. And the most beautiful bit for me was, you know, in this sort of camping interior, there's a little sink that had a plug. The plug would fly into the middle of the screen and hang and then drop back down again. Because as it went, the gravity worked and animated the interior space. And yet when you went round to see the real thing, it was just a prop. It didn't really make much sense other than the spectacle of something going round and round. So as I say, that made a couple of ideas. This is the last one. This was a piece in Italy. This is in Bergamo, where we took an Italian vehicle, one of these little Piaggios, um, and I think this was a good movie. The last one, the first one, the taxi was called Meters Running. The other one you just saw was a caravan. What was that called? What was it called? Um, oh, it'll come to me. And this one's called Road Movie. This was a, a more probably a little bit more technical and probably not as successful. The idea was that the Piaggio, again, its rotisserie was going round and round. But on the floor, where I did, there was a camera that was allowed to randomly just run up and down. And it's rather like peeling an orange. You know, when you take a three-dimensional object and you peel it, you can flat it out. And the idea here was that that information, that one information is relayed to a television screen or a monitor. And what you had is this constant scrolling of information. The original idea here was actually to have a printer that ran backwards and forwards on a continuous roll of paper. So you convert the mass of the vehicle into a document that was, you know, stacked paper. And then that would come out and start going around the room. So that's like feeling the object. The mm -hmm. camera would just pick moments as it ran around. And you convert two-dimensional. But the cost of that was prohibitive. So we went for a live situation in the end, which, you know, Kind of worked. And that's the screen there, it's the thing that's buzzing around. So it's like, you know, when you see those classic movies where the car shoots by and then you just get highways whizzing past. You've got the real thing in movement, and then you've got second hand information coming to monitor in detail, just taking a moment, a detailed movement. Okay, this next piece is coming closer to today. I think this is about 2009, 2008, 2009. This is an outdoor piece at a new in Chelsea. It's called Shackstack. And quite simply, um, it sits 
in, as I say, a complete new build, um, high-rise, modern condominiums, very expensive, down by the river, and they wanted something that chimed with that environment. And what I reckon you looked at is, in England, we have a particular thing called the allotment. This is where you know individuals will rent a, a bit of land and be able to grow their own fruit and veg, or flowers, should they wish. It's very cheap, they're not that big. And they have clusters in the urban environment, less rural. Um, but what's quite interesting is, you know, everyone wants to build their little shared store to keep, you know, their tools, etc., for the allotment. But there's no rules on those sheds, the way they're built. It's almost like they're brick and learn. One can throw the rules out for architecture. And by that, they're made of doors and windows and that sort of thing. But windows can be put together to make a roof. Doors can be thrown together to make a roof. So they're made, they're made from bags, they're made from all sorts of things, but they're, they're quite extraordinary because although initially they appear to be thoughtless, they're absolutely thought about. They're genuinely, you can see the way a piece of wood made like that holds that to that. But it's done without, I was going to say, without aesthetic, without style. It's done completely function. And so what I decided to do is take drawings and measurements, etc., from a whole series of these bricola huts and then produce them as out of castings, as panels, and then put them as decoupage. So they get quite fragile and precarious. In actual fact, and stack, but in actual fact, you know, they were, was a fundamental. They had structure to them. Hence, piece of work. And as I say, it's almost as if they were, they were having a dialogue, this other sense of order that the architecture that surrounded them was having. As you can see behind, that's the sort of architecture. So there was kind of, on the one hand, a clash, but it was just about you know, the sense of order architecture has. You can have, you can have regimentation, uh, or you can have non-regimentation. That was called Shackstack. This piece of work is called Square the Block. Actually, the London School of Economics on a high street in central London called Holland. And it's very difficult to see off this, I was going to say slide, but thank you, uh, off this uh, digital image. But you've got um, running up this way, and I forgot the name of the street that runs outside, but where that facade, that flat facade, runs up and takes the kick round into the Turn up side street, there's a chamfered wall. By that, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go 90 degrees. It runs, and there's a 45 degree moment, and then it's off in Sardinia Street, side street. And there was a competition to place a piece of work, actually only to the first two floors. And I put in a proposal. It's really to sort of transform the footprint of the building. So we're going back to a very formal positioning here, um, where. <coughs> What I would do was put back, or I say put back, put in a ninth degree where a five degree existed. All the other structures and skins of architecture in that street conformed to that ninth degree corner or edge. Uh, this was the only example street. So what we did is we took a casting off the main high street, one strip two metres wide, all the way down, completely abandoned. And we did the same on the side street, Sardinia, and then we took those forms we made lots of the mould we took the cast in Jesmonite, which is a, a kind of a fiberglass base, in fact not fiberglass, not actual petroleum base, it's not really base. And then we cast those two edges, we put them together. They made no architectural sense whatever. You've got half bits of window and half bits of uh, freeze work, uh, stucco work and windowsill meeting its counterpart in side street. So architecturally it's completely wrong. But what it does is it fulfills the situation of completing the 90 degrees, except for this kind of tangled mass here, where we put the mould up to free up the walkway as you take from Holborn round into Sardinia. We weren't allowed to come down to that before and touch the ground. And I went through many kind of modes of drawing and model making to see how we could get around the problem. And the best thing seems to be that abruptness of just ramming the, the mould breaking it and getting it so that that's up the pavement area. 
And in a way, it's a chameleon word because it's very difficult to spot the thieves, um, especially if you're moving in a vehicle. It's only when you're a pedestrian that you start to notice that something odd is happening. And then when you stop, you get it. But it's a bit, like I say, it's a bit of a chameleon, especially amongst all the other, I say, skins of people. Very, very disparate in architecture taking place there. I think what's also quite good about this piece of work, it has happened in other pieces, where, you know, the building red sculpture like a badge, in a way it presents a sort of, um, you know, a mindset of which the NSC are. I mean, it was very brave of them to make, you know, to take me on for this commission, because I was asking them to do to go much further than what the the actual commission allowed. So these are obviously more detailed to be an idea. So I mean actually that makes it quite clear the you know the side street the chamfer and then straight up the high street to the whole of the station. And that's what you see in up to and that's a clear indication that collision that architecture shouldn't do, but in this situation does. Threw this in as an example that you know one gets the idea that these are major, major pieces. Everything's a major work, but that doesn't mean to say that they have to be big. You know, scale has to be big, or the size has to be big. I mean, one of the common questions I'll ask is, you know, why is it that you build such enormous work? If you're playing tampering with architecture, you're only working at that scale, so that dictates it. But um, as you can see from the extra upstairs, the encounter exhibition. Academy of Asian Artists, um, you know, I put a piece in there, which is of a human scale, and in this situation, albeit a, a sense of maquette, um, is a demonstration really in this, in this presentation to show that there are some of the work. In this case, it actually is a, a proposal that has been ongoing for a while. I don't think it'll ever get built, but I wanted to make an object that existed somewhere between being a mat and being solid and being liquid. And the best way of, the best example if I think of that is at that point between metal being heated and melting, or being melted and chilling and becoming stiff again. That alchemic moment where things transform into another, as it were, material. And this idea was for a two cube that should be heated almost to its melting point and then allowed to cool down. And that's the duration of the exhibition. And in that respect, the exhibition starts with this almost white heat block of metal that you couldn't get near to. I think it's 60 yards we calculated. And then as the thing cools down, and it will cool quite suddenly, it would be out of what they call the orange tone within a day. But you still couldn't let, get that close. But after about a month, you could start to almost touch it. So it was just sort of working for that. Okay, just the last couple of pieces, but I've, I've kind of made these quite detailed. Uh, Folkestone Tree and Folkestone was a south coast resort. It was always populated in the summer. It's very close to London. It was a haunt that people enjoyed going down to. And the sense of theme park, the sense of the pavilion, the sense of the crazy golf course, I don't know if anyone knows about crazy golf courses. But this unfortunately Folkestone it inclined. And it has been for a number of years since the tunnel opened, took you know our traffic to France. It meant the the seaport of Folkestone had finished. Ships or ferries no longer left from there. And a very wealthy entrepreneur who lives in Folkestone decided to try and reinvent Folkestone in some way. And what he thought in that rebranding was to bring art to the situation. And so a tree and art was organised. And this is 2008, and I was one of a number of artists invited down to make a piece of work, a temporary piece of work for Folkestone. And I came across this disused game, which is a bit like golf, but it's, it's crazy golf. And it has its own sort of quality. You have different, you have 18 playing holes, 18 of these moments, and you've got to get the ball through these obstacles to get it down the hole. And what I tried to do was use the metaphor of this disused disregarded moment of Folkestone, this overgrown space that's once been, you know, tried on the Esplanade, and to actually cut this horizontal flat in the ground game 
and rebuild it in some other way, so it transforms our notion, running in parallel, let's say, our notion of Folkestone. So the idea was to um, work out what could be done with the game that spoke out the notion of rebuild. And I came from beach huts further along the coast, and the idea here is 18 holes would give me 18 panels, each with its own hole in. But if you can understand three beach huts to sit on the, on the beach itself, they use the 18 panels. So you've got two gable ends, two gables, two gable ends, that's it. Two roofs, two sections of roof, two sections of another six, and two sides, two sides, two sides. 18 panels cut in this way would give me uh, three huts. So we proceeded to mark it all out and get a team of experts, uh, a diamond saw, in to cut the panel. And then, over a period of five weeks, travelling backwards and forwards with the team I put together, we worked on excavation and transforming the horizontal plane of that game into these three new things that, that stated rebuild and that the town of has formation. And these are the three huts that have now been you know, renovated up and cleaned and repainted and skinned. And each one, as you can see, holds, each panel holds on top, hence the title 18 holes. The concrete posts that you can see on there are actual pathways, so they no longer need to be a pathway. They've transformed themselves. The function of path is not important anymore. They become kind of an aesthetic detail. In the same way as the light blue is representational in the game as, you know, the lake or the pond. But in this situation, they become an abstract decoration to entice us to the surface. That piece, as it were, was bequeathed. It was pretty much impossible for me to move it away. Obviously, it's several tons of material. And I didn't have a home, so it's not allowed to stay. And fortunately, we haven't had any vandalism, so fingers crossed. Okay, so again, I'll go through this as a detail. This is what you've probably heard about. It's featured upstairs in the film. Um, I'll do it uh, this is what's, what's titled The Old Yates's Wine Lodge up in Liverpool, a disused, derelict, abandoned, although still owned, building in the centre of town that no one really wants, no one really looks at it, and is due for demolition. It has been due for demolition for about nine years. Um, and in 2005 or 4, Liverpool was voted to be the, or 2005, was voted to be the European capital of culture for 2008. And that meant central government money from Tony Blair going up to northwest, going up to Liverpool and its surrounding region, and to be invested in sorts of ways for a festival, predominantly a cultural festival, to entice possible, you know, people with factories looking to locate or relocate, to maybe think about coming up to the North West because it was a happy place. And so I fortuitously was talking to uh, a director of the Liverpool Bienal, Lewis Biggs, socially in 2006, and said, have you got any buildings up in Liverpool that have actually got this idea? Now this, this was on the back burner for about, about 11 years. It ha it's a happy accident from another piece of work. And I told him about the idea, and he'd gone in contact with me the next day and said, come up and have a look at some buildings. And the idea was that what we would do is we would generate, we would try and achieve, build this idea to take place for the European Catholic culture, but we would open it summer 2007 as a flag wavy piece so that it announces Liverpool in some way through the media, nationally and internationally. And then people start to focus on Liverpool because of this recognised piece of work. So the idea was, I, my idea would play, would be switched on, and it would run throughout the latter part of 2007 and 2008. The piece was called Turning the Place Over, and the idea was, again, a kind of a formless stance initially, where what I wanted to do was take mm -hmm. the order of architecture and turn it on its head. I made a similar piece, must say, about 11 years pre this over easy, which is something of a bearing, an eight metre bearing that just oscillated but subtly. In this situation, the idea was to put a hole in the building 
and turn the facade 360 degrees continuously throughout the hours of daylight, but in such a way that not only did it enter into itself, but it also thrown out across the pavement. Um, obviously, these things don't get done by me alone. I mean, I work with teams most of the time, and in this situation, I work with mechanical engineers, I work with structural engineers, and I worked with a very small um, building group from Lancaster, who I'd never met before, I worked with them. Uh, they were the only ones who would pick up on this. Um, what happens is, in these situations, sometimes for major builders and fabricators, is that the profit margins are very, very small in relation to the amount of problem solving. So it was very, very difficult to find someone to actually build this piece of work. But we came across this uh, company that decided to do it. The first thing that needed to do was, because we're in a drawing building, we need to, need to make a kind of analysis of the building and work out how its structure works, because we needed to come away a certain amount. So, Price and Line Structural Engineers um, investigated, pulled parts of the building down to investigate where the steel was, discovered what was there, also had to make assumptions, but then came up with a scheme to basically give the building a facelift, which is basically pull the facade backwards through the roof and hold it and pin it down. Then it was to cut the, the front of the facade from the floors away to get all the gear in that we needed to do. So a whole rectilinear section was pulled out and a spindle and the engines were put in, or the motors were put in, and the floor was all cut back. And then the, the basic, you know, motors, etc. went in. The, the iron section for the 14-metre spindle that we turned the building. And then this one called the slew ring, this back section, is two very small three-head engines at it, but the gearboxes that do most of the work, powered by a big electrical system at the back that would allow the 26 tonne of facade. But that 26, foot, that 26 tonne had to be positioned in some way so it wouldn't just crumble. So a coat hanger of steel was built. It's like an ovoid, it's difficult to describe, but if you've got a flat screen and you go like that with a pastry cutter, circular, it will give you a circle. If you go in sideways, it will give you an oval. So that was the theory. It's in line with the spindle. So it's the ovoid from one position in the screen. So once that was all assembled, the stonework was then replaced, and then the outer section of rectilinear stone was also replaced. So that what you have is a section of facade with a gap running all the way around it. And there you can see where that circular element has all been put back. That's all the original stone, albeit slightly lightened. We had to shape back the stone off to get as much weight down as possible. And then of course we had the opening in the middle of the, um, the middle of June, it was, or late May, early June 2007. And then what I'll do is just show you, this is about two minutes long, it just shows you what actually takes place. So bear with me, this I haven't put the front of the sound in. I had no idea how fast I wanted it to be. I thought it would be slightly faster than when we were building. Um, and the way we found the speed was quite empirical, actually. We, we ran it up, and in the street, people would walk and look and carry on. But we found that the speed, we tracked it to a big crowd, and we tested it for three days. I don't know why. There's a speed where people really stop and watch. <laughs> I had one pass the by technique, but this was the Yates' Wine Lodge, which is where it serves something called Aussie White, which is white wine, which is, gets you really pissed, but it's pretty cheap. That's why it's always fortunate. And he said, there's a lot of people who've seen the building do that before you do that. <laughs> <laughs> so you get the idea. It's taking the sense of order of architecture and turning it on its head. Basically, again, it's like taking the rules that we kind of comply to and like tweaking the rules. And with things like that, what happens is a derelict is written off building that no one wants to look at actually ends up inviting people from all over the world coming down to where's the derelict building? And you do something to it 
that doesn't necessarily mean you have to pull it out and put back new, but you take the old and the discarded and the forgotten, and with imagination and with art, let's say, in this case, sculpture, you can get people to look again at something that they've written off. You just tweak it in such a way that a magic is performed, and it makes them have to think about, you know, their world around them. Okay, this is the last piece now I'll introduce you to. And this is something that hasn't been built yet. But this is the new Terminal 2 at Heathrow Airport that's being constructed presently. It won't be ready until mid-2014. Um, but I won a competition for a piece of work that's to sit in what they call the covered courtyard. It's not quite within the terminal, and it's not quite outdoors. It's basically a roof and a glazed front, but the sides are open to the others. And unfortunately, and I, the idea, there was a film that described how this worked. But what I proposed was, okay, it's an airport. Let's take an aeroplane, and let's throw it. Um, what's, what's the shape that that would make if it was thrown? Now, there's a couple of things that, you know, start to sort of suggest here. But to try and understand what it is I'm trying to do, if I, you know, it was filled with clay all the way to the end, this is a fictitious fictitious scenario, remember. I took this pair of glasses and I threw it in that clay so it landed on the floor over there. And I picked all that clay up and I poured plaster in. Then I excavated it. The shape that that makes going through the clay because I just chucked it, it's that shape I'm doing with an aeroplane. Of course, what I've got to be very careful of is, you know, aeroplane, however big or small, flying around indoors, rings alarm bells to certain people because of certain things that happen in our past. So what one had to do is come up with an optimistic ending. So what you, what you basically do is take a day, and this can only, only, only be done in virtual world. I've tried five with maquettes and drawings, I can't get through it. But again, going back to Cousin Mike, they've crunched numbers up, 15 months we've got it. You basically take these models and you put them through certain programs and then you throw them. And then you sort of say, well, okay, I don't want it to do that. And you go back to the beginning and you throw it again. And then when you get what you've got, then it slices it all up and gives you the structure you need to build to be able to see the thing realised. So it's quite a comprehensive thing. And my, you know, I come at it from the point of the glasses being thrown. So I've been doing things like push, pushing things into clay as almost possible. I've been buying vats and vats of butter or margarine. And I've been sort of pushing them through and putting them together. It's giving something up which is quite interesting. It's one of those ideas. You're going for that. And something goes off at a tangent, you hold that for a future. It's not quite what I want. I'm just cobbling together a rather crude thing. But the engineers have been working, I've been calling them once a week, and we work weekly on this. So the first stage is we managed to start these models off. If you can imagine, this is the beginning of that aeroplane that's going, so it's kind of spinning. It's not doing what an aeroplane does, it's spinning. It's only when it gets about here that it turns, and then it starts to fly up and away, and it was going to be long, but we've reduced it to 78 metres. That means it stops before the bridge, and optimistically, even that flies up over the bridge. It's very important in this situation. Look, it got a lot of people very nervous. They didn't want to fly in the bridge. <coughs> but that gives you an idea of the scale. You've got these two gears down here. And that gives you some demonstration of what all that object does as it moves and cuts itself through the air. It's if you can imagine the air around it being solid, it's what it's doing as a drawing in that space. I think there's one from... Yeah, this is one looking up, up, and, up and away. So there you've got the very end. Of course, it's a bit like you push your hand into clay. That bit there is realistic, but that will just be straight. But that's, you know, difficult to explain, I suppose. But that's what you get. You get that frontal detail. But of course, at the start, you get the same thing. There's a couple of models that detail how that's made. What we've got to do is, once you've got that model in the virtual world, you then start to eat out, you chop it up, that gives you your bulkheads every meter. And then between the bulkheads, you then start to put on what are called cones, basically, on the bulkhead. Then onto those cones, onto these lots of lines, you then clad with plywood, two skins. Then once the skins are over, you pop rivet your aluminium. So using albeit a kind of very early method of airplane construction. You are working very similar to what an airplane used to be built like. And then there's all sorts of things that's trying to scale it up. 
bigger than an A300. Um, I think it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and a bit root masters. And these are just some of the ways of which I'm trying to describe how it begins and ends. So you get a, set, a little bit of a sense of reality there with the tumbling. But I hope, like here, that wing tip, that line there, you can see it curls round. So whatever that curl is doing, that is the edge of the wings going through its movement. This is called split stream. That's it coming up to me. And this is the kind of stages that we went to about four months ago to try and get to that structure. I mean, you're going from a very complex 400 millimeter steel box section with what they call the spiders coming off and then all your spars. That moves into all your bulkheads. There's uh, obviously the fixing onto the column. We had a very, very severe problem held us up six months. We had um, the Department of Trade and Industry got wind of what was going on and came and visited and said that they really didn't want it to go ahead, that Heathrow was a different target and different target. You can't even do these kind of things, albeit Heathrow had commissioned the work. So we had to put a section of this and take it up to just outside of Scotland, just up in North England, where we subjected it to bomb blast. And they say our whole territory, different colored bands, and they cut and paint everything you've done. And depending where everything gets scattered, they'll be able to calculate what you need to do to you know, reinforce the structure. Or they can stop the structure built. In this situation, we built so well, it didn't go anywhere, which horrified them, because they were hoping to close us down. But what it told them, and understandably, was that if a bomb went off, the lateral loading, that means you know, if you've got the side load of the structure, pushed and it's fastened onto the columns, we would bend the columns and bring the roof down. So we spent another four to five months designing slewing or basically sliding steel, sliding steel mechanism, the breaking mechanism that moves 150 millimetres. So if a bang went off, it just moved about that much. On the column, we're putting, we're transferring the load directly to the column. And it's unfortunate, it's taken a lot of money to get to that stage, so we've, we've kind of been but this is my last picture to show you something of the CGI that generated, just to give you a sense of how that structure will work in that space. I mean, what it does is it makes Terminal 2 very grown up. It makes something Terminal 2, fortunately now, when it opens, in the street, a gateway into the, you know, the centre of London. It's actually, it's actually something that one hopes is a real welcoming to London and shows, you know, the sort of imagination that one might find within the city. Thank you very much. Whether I <laughs> set up, but, you know, I mean, if you want to ask any questions, I know we do have a roving microphone to ask things if there's any queries about. You know. I think I have a lot actually. Yeah, okay, that's good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very sure all of us have enjoyed that talk. In appreciation, we would like to invite Professor Steve Ditton, President of the Cell College of the Arts, to present a tone of appreciation to Richard Wilson. Steve, please. Oh. The tone of appreciation is a new work by Luke Nick, Electri, DA, and his fun art student. Title number 44, this work is based on the Chinese Technician system of teaching and is a visual representation of one of its hexagrams. In its modern interpretations, the 44 term, which you see here, has been translated to encountering. Thank you, Steve. With that, we'll now come to the end of this evening's program. Thank you for coming, and please do join us at the reception outside. It's open to everybody. Um, ladies and gentlemen, can we please put our hands together one time for Richard?